Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There are two keys to basically understanding the Bible. Of course, without the Spirit of the Lord, you cannot understand the Bible, but there are two keys. Well, you see that picture that I use for my, uh, I guess you could say avatar or whatever, the thumbnail picture, the Bible with the two keys on it. Well, that's what it stands for. The two keys to understanding the Bible. One, who are the true children of the Lord? And two, who are not the children of of the Lord. You know, there's a group of people and they'll try to convince you that whosoever will means anybody and everybody. All you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what they'll tell you. So let's examine that. Oh boy, I've read this a lot, but we'll read it again. James, the book of James, chapter 2. James is a very interesting character. He was a leader of a church. And he had a mother named Mary. And a father named Joseph. Yes, and he grew up with a guy named Jesus. So... You know, I can only imagine what uh, those that grew up with Jesus in the household were thinking, you know. Uh, you know, I, I would have been very interesting to hear some of the things that they were saying. Of course, uh, what did Mary say to the kids? You know, uh, there's no telling. So let's read James chapter 2. You know, there's people who say, oh, well, all you got to do is believe on Jesus, and uh, that's it. You're saved. That's the Billy Graham, I'm sorry, Billy Goat Graham formula. Verse 1, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, you know, really nasty clothing, right? That's what raiment is. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and, you, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Yeah, so you can smell my feet, right? Yeah, so, you know, the guy that's got the money, you're going to give him the good spot. And the, the, the guy that's poor, you're going to have him sit and smell your feet. Really? Oh, that's right. Yeah, or we got to pass that collection plate around, right? I mean, that's the modern. Uh, yeah, that's the modern uh, way of thinking. Verse 4, it says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, or listen, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Uh, has anything changed in almost 2,000 years? Do rich do the rich oppress us? Well, I could tell you stories about the rich, especially the super rich. Uh, I know who they are, and they know who I am. Well, they probably don't, but I'm on their list. Of course, uh, I got a bigger target on my back than uh, the store target, right? Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? 
Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? Now what is that worthy name by which ye are called? Uh, Christians! Let's take a break and look at that for a few seconds. Now, there are those that'll say, oh, well, Christians, that's a bad word. You know, that's a bad word. Well, let's look at Acts 11.26. Now, this is not, this is just kind of uh, throwing it out there. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. Now, Antioch has been mentioned good in uh, scriptures as compared to other places. He brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, does that say it's good? No. Does it say it's bad? No. Okay. However, let's take a look at something else. Paul in Acts 26. Paul's been brought before King Agrippa and Festus. Uh, Acts 26 and verse 21. Let's put the... Um, Blame where blames drew. Now, Paul was caught up Paul was uh, well, how do I put this? Paul was uh, he's telling the story of how he was called from being a Jew to becoming a Christian. Well, and then the Jews accused him of blasphemy and some Roman soldiers came because they heard that he was a Roman citizen and they protected him, or at least that's how the story goes, right? And Paul decides he wants to talk on his behalf. Acts 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Who is accusing him? The Jews. Not the Romans, the Jews. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. Oh yeah, Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, a very learned uh, rabbi, I guess you could say. I've read some of Gamaliel's writings. According to legend, he became a Christian when he heard about Paul. Or maybe Paul talked to him. I don't know. I mean, there's stuff that happened that's not recorded in the Bible. But Paul was very well known. My manner of youth, uh, my manner, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God 
unto our fathers. Unto which promise our 12 tribes, not just one measly little tribe that claims to be the chosen people in the Middle East. There's 11 tri other tribes besides Judah people. Unto which promise our 12 tribes. Oh, wait a minute. The churches say that the, the, the 10 lost tribes. Well, Paul, Paul knew where the 12 tribes were. The, 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 the tribes are only lost to the churches, not God, not Paul. Verse 7, unto which promise are 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews, not the Romans. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceeding mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Uh, take a little break here for a second before we go on. Those that deny Paul have to destroy, discount, and remove the book of Acts from the Bible. Because the Bible, in the book of Acts, records the conversion of Paul, the apostle. So when they say, oh, well, Paul's a fake apostle, well, tell those people to rip out the book of Acts from their Bible and throw it in the garbage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, records Paul as an apostle. And they want you, the Paul haters, want you to think that the Holy Spirit failed to warn the apostles that Paul was a fake. Yeah, that's what they want you to believe. All right, so Paul sees a shining bright light. Verse 14, and when we, were, when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for me to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Oh, boy. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both to these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now that's the end of Jesus speaking. Now we're going to, Paul's speaking. Well, I mean, Paul was repeating the words of Christ. Verse 19. This is Paul speaking his own words now. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Works. See, works follow faith. But some people will try to convince you that if you do good works that it's you're trying to earn your faith. You know... When you hear that garbage, you know you're speaking to one of Satan's agents. 
Good works follow faith always. Or it should. Or you got fake a fake conversion, probably. That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. 21. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. I don't read anything about Rome there, do you? No. Verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. You know, he's saying, Paul, you're crazy. All this learning is making you crazy. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. You know, he's saying, you know all this. You know, you better believe when uh, a big religious movement pops up and spreads like wildfire, you better believe the king is going to be paying attention to what's going on. You know, these things are not hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Oh, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? What did Paul say? Uh-uh, don't use that word. That's a nasty word. We don't like the word Christian. That's horrible. No, he didn't say that. What did Paul say? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, such as I am, except these bonds. See, Paul didn't tell King Agrippa that, you know, Christian's a bad name. He says, you know... Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me, th hear me this day were both almost and all together, such as I am, except these bonds. How about the book of Peter? Chap 1 Peter 4.16 he writes, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Is Christian a bad word? No. Only if you're like a Jehovah's Witness or something. They, they, there are people I'll tell you that Christian is a bad word. Uh, it's, they either work for the devil or they're extremely ignorant. Let's go back to James chapter 2. Verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name? By the which ye are called Christians. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law, 
as transgressors. Transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can't. All right, let's start uh, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, listen carefully. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? In other words, if you don't clothe them, clothe them and feed them, what good is your stinking, lousy profession of faith? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 19 kills the billy goat Graham, believe on Jesus and come into my heart thing. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Oh, but I was always taught, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, Satan believes in Jesus. So do the devils. They know exactly who he is. Are they saved? I think not. Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by his works was faith made perfect? You see, people, what you believe will determine your actions. You know, people that take the mark of the beast... They believe the beast over the words of the Bible. They believe that over the words of Christ. They are going to believe the beast over Jesus. But, Bob, we're not going to be here. Well, if I'm not here, it's because they killed me. Or I died of whatever. Cancer or whatever. You know, that's the deal. What you believe dictates what you do and all these people that are they're going to end up probably they're going to end up taking the mark of the beast a lot of people are a lot of churchgoers because they've been brainwashed and they don't believe the bible i mean if they believed it they would spend time reading it wouldn't they i mean I know people that go to church professing, professing a faith in Christ. They could tell you every sports stat for the last 20 years for their favorite team. Oh, do you know that quarterback so-and-so, he got 11,000 uh, passing yards, uh, whatever, you know. Ladies, that's a football thing. American football, not soccer. I mean, yeah, it's just... Unbelievable.
Seest thou how faith wrought by his works and by his works with faith made perfect? We're talking about Abraham. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Boy, I would love to be called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Uh, I believe that's in the book of Joshua, the sixth book of the Old Testament. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, why is it that the Pharisees were after the Christians? Why? Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes, and who were the scribes? The scribes were the copyists of the scriptures. They, you know, back, they didn't have a printing press back then. You know, they didn't have books. Everything was hand copied, handwritten. And believe it or not, uh, every number, I mean, every, every letter was assigned a number in the Hebrew and Greek. And what they would do is when they would copy a book in the Bible, they would add up all the numbers across and then down. And if the numbers added up, lined up, they know that there was no errors in what they copied. I mean, it was a meticulous very time labor intensive time consuming venture to do this but they would they would add the rows and i remember working at a hotel and we used to have a balance sheet and you would do the rows across let's say you would have 10 rows across 10 down and you'd add up all the figures across and then you'd do all the rows downward. And then you would add up all those numbers and come to a grand total. Well, if all the numbers matched sideways and up and down, and it all added up to the grand total, you know that the balance sheet was right. That was how you could check. Well, that's what they used to do with the Bible. They would add up all the words, numerical values, all the letters. And, you know, if, if everything added up, they knew that there were no errors. And people say, ah, oh, well, you know, the Bible's just copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. You know, well, there's no originals. So we don't know. Really, you don't believe that the Lord who created heaven and earth could keep his words straight? I mean, there's people like James White. That's their whole ministry, is uh, correcting all the mistakes that all the people throughout history have done. God couldn't possibly have kept his words straight. So we got to have somebody like James White to go out there and fix everything that God couldn't keep straight. Yeah. Yeah. God couldn't do it, but James White can. And what's sad is uh, the Muslims will say, well, you know, the Bible's corrupted. And then James White, who's supposedly debating the Muslims, say, well, you know, you guys are right, but we know where the errors are and we're correcting them. So the Bible is right. And what gets me is People that are supposedly Christians support that ministry. 
Uh, unbelievable. You know, when you got somebody agreeing with the Muslims that the Bible is uh, wrong, maybe you uh, should call them out for being a heretic instead of a, you know, uh, whatever. Matthew 15, 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Uh, is there anything wrong with eat, washing your hands when you uh, get ready to eat bread? No. No, there's not. I mean, mom always said, go wash your hands before you eat. Good idea, you know, but it's not about washing their hands. They probably, now I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that they had a little ritual. Okay, you got to take your right hand and cover on top of your left hand, and then you got to go in a circular motion uh, clockwise and then counterclockwise and then wash the top and then wash the bottom and then in between the fingers and you got to do this a certain way because that's what God wants us to do I suspect that they had a little ritual a certain way of washing their hands why do thy disciples transgress the tradition tradition of the elders for they wash not their hands when they eat bread but he jesus answered and said unto them why do ye also transgress the commandment of god by your tradition for god commanded saying honor thy father and mother and he that curseth father or mother let him die the death Yeah, the Bible says if you cursed your parents, you would die. You should be put to death. But ye say, Babylonian Talmud, and by the way, there's a book called the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, you can order it on Amazon. I forget how many volumes it is. It's like an encyclopedia. I mean, you could spend well over $1,000 buying a copy uh well it's like an encyclopedia it's a set of volumes of books it's huge and the word talmud means learning so babylonian talmud means babylonian learning or learning from babylon babylonian learning hmm mystery babylon the great anybody For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Well, that's what the Bible says. But ye say, this is in your Babylonian Talmud, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Uh, in other words, if he curses his parents for a, you know, if he curses his parents, He's giving them a gift. Yeah. Cursing your parents is a gift, according to the Babylonian Talmud. Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, mother he shall be free. In other words, he's free from the Bible penalty of death. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And if you people think I don't know what I'm talking about, let me tell you something. I went to the public library in Boca Raton, Florida, one of the most heavily uh, you know who -ish areas in the United States. New York City is number one. Los Angeles is number two. South Florida is number three. I looked that up in the reference section of the library i've read portions of the babylonian talmud which is a death sentence by the way according to the rabbis because they don't want you people to read that stuff because well 
basically there's a rabbi that said that uh, if we knew what they taught and believed, it would be their death. I mean, there's a reason why a certain group was kicked out of 100 different countries over the last, oh, I don't know, 2,000 years. So, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. You know, it's not what goes into your mouth that will defile you. It's what comes out. Do you dishonor the Lord by the words that comes out of your mouth? Verse 12, then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Ooh, Jesus offended those poor Pharisees that were teaching the tradition of the elders, the Babylonian Talmud. Verse 13, listen to this carefully. But he, Jesus, answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now, wait a minute. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. But the Bible declares that God created all things. How can that be possible? Is this just a figure of speech? Is Jesus just, you know, throwing that out there without really any meaning? In Colossians chapter 1. Now, remember, Paul wrote this. I guess we'll just go verse 14. Uh, well, maybe we'll go a little bit before that. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us from the kingdom, uh, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, for by who? Christ. For by him were all things created. Oh, wait a minute. How can all things be created by him if every plant that hadn't been planted by the Father would be rooted up and, you know, wait a minute. This is confusing, Chaplain Bob. Well, let's keep reading. We'll, we'll, get, there. we'll get there in a bit. For by him, Jesus, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All right. In Revelation 4.11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
Let's take a look at Isaiah 45. And the uh, you-know-whos dare to print a coin, uh, to mint a coin that uh, takes Trump and likens him to who we're getting ready to read here, Cyrus. I don't think so, but Isaiah 45, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to sh open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now, I believe it was Cyrus that uh, destroyed Babylon, or was it Darius? I forget. But um, they were the ones that allowed Judah to go return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the temple. Verse 2. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasure of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect... I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Listen to this. I form the light and create darkness. Well, what is, uh, when darkness is hit with light, it's no longer darkness. But when you withdraw the light, you have darkness. I mean, what is darkness? Darkness is nothing but the absence of light. What is cold? Cold is is the absence of warmth. What is evil? The absence of God. Think about it. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Well, if you read... Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the Lord created all things and he looked and it was very good. There was a time when Satan, before he fell, was good. Did you know that? But he decided he wanted to be the top dog, the head cheese, the big kahuna. He wanted to be the boss and decided, well, I'm going to overthrow God and... Um, uh, well, that plan didn't work out too well. But technically, God created Satan good, who fell and became evil. So technically, when you think about it, God created the evil. And even in Satan's fall, Satan is fulfilling a purpose of the Lord. Think about it. Satan is fulfilling God's purpose. Judas Iscariot served a purpose of the Lord. Believe it or not, he did. And the man of sin, the false prophet, the beast, will all serve a purpose of the Lord. Now, what is the deal here? What is this that uh, the thing about if, if Jesus created all things, why did he say that every plant that my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up? Uh, well, let's take a look. Wheat and the tares, people. 
Tares are wheat. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, wheat is wheat and tares are weeds. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at some parables here. All right, Matthew 13, verse 1. We're not going to read the entire chapter. Uh, let's see. Verse 1. Matthew 13, 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Boy, it must have been crowded, huh? And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundred, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Great parable, very applicable to that today. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You know, why are you telling these funny stories? Why don't you just tell us plainly? Come on, Jesus, get with the program. And, you know, I know I've said this in the past, and I'll have to say it again. I've heard preachers say, well, you know, Jesus taught in parables so that people could understand things easily. But you know what? That's not what Jesus says. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He, Jesus, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. See, there were probably a lot of spies, probably from Herod, probably from Pilate, uh, you know, Rome, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, there were probably a lot of spies. You know, anytime you start having large groups of people hanging around a leader, you're going to pique the interest of the politicians. Uh, that's just the way it is. They're going to send people there to say, hey, what's this guy talking about? What's What's going on? Is he plotting to overthrow Rome? Uh, what's going on here? I mean, let's face it. That's just the way things are. And those that are not of God's people, Jesus is hiding the gospel from them. Boy, you never hear that taught in church. Oh, God loves everybody, whosoever will. Um, Satan and his angels believe in God. Are they saved? I've actually heard preachers say that Satan eventually gets saved because he believes in Jesus. Praise a Jesus. I mean, really? Really? My Bible says a lake of fire, but hey, that's just me. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they 
understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. You know, you might hear, but you ain't going to get it. Verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. They're spiritual eyes. Lest at any time should they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Well, let's see. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth or endureth for a while. For when tribulation, trouble, or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Oh yeah, all these people that are running around saying, Oh, play, praise Jesus! And uh, when they uh, start having persecution, trouble, oh yeah, they're offended. Hey, I didn't sign up for this stuff. Why, why Benny Hinn and, and, and Kenneth Copeland told me that uh, once, once I accept Jesus, Jesus wants me to be rich and to be free of disease and healthy and wealthy and wise and you know I'm just gonna be like a, a king that's not what Jesus taught he taught we would be hated of all men Wow was Billy goat Graham hated of all men why was he invited to uh, the White House all those many times well, I'll tell you what, if he'd, have, if he'd have blasted them with a double barrel gospel rebuke, he never would have been invited back to the White House ever. Yeah. Yeah, Billy Goat Graham. Yeah, he was loved. Everybody loved Billy Goat Graham. That's because he didn't teach what Jesus taught. By and by, he is offended. That's right. When you, uh, when you start preaching the real stuff, people are going to be offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he become unfruitful. That's right. You want the things of this world? You want the riches of this world? It'll choke the word out. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. Isn't that what we read in... James chapter 2, 
you know, a, a, an apple tree doesn't produce apples to become an apple tree. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. And a Christian that's saved by faith will show good fruit. It's a byproduct of salvation. If there's no fruit on that tree or bad fruit on that tree, you better examine the type of tree it is. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. That's right. 24. Verse 24. Here's the meat and potatoes, people. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, people, I did an entire playlist on the wheat and the tares. To me, this is one of the most important. If you want to understand the Bible, especially all the why the Lord wanted to destroy the... Israel to destroy the Canaanites in the Old Testament. This is a very, very important parable. Very important. But the church just, oh, they just explain this away. Oh, well, you know, when you believe in Jesus, you turn from a weed into, a, into wheat. And when you believe in Jesus, the goat turns into a sheep. No, people. Weeds do not turn into wheat, and goats do not turn into sheep. A sheep might act like a goat. Uh, a wheat might produce no fruit and be useless like a, a weed. But, a, we, but a, a weed does not turn into wheat. It doesn't happen. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares, or the weeds, also. But the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Wait a minute, Farmer Joe, I, I mean, Farmer Jesus, I, I thought you planted good seed, you know, the good wheat in your field. What's up with all these weeds, dude? So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou... Now, thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Good question. Where's all these weeds coming from? Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares... Ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Keep that in mind. You know, this is a good thing to show pre-tribbers. Gather ye together first the tares. And bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now, we could keep reading, but I don't want to. Uh, 
let's see. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Uh, can Hey, Jesus, uh, we don't get it. Can you explain this to us, please? He, Jesus, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Wow. Do you know what happened in Genesis 6? The giants? Anybody? You know, that's one of Satan's best kept secrets. You have no idea how many people I've banned from the, my channel because they're either deceived or deceivers. I mean, I you know, I've done hours studies proving the sons of God of Genesis 6 are the same sons of God of Job 38. They're angels. You know, people want you to think that believing men married unbelieving women and then they had giants for children. And then God got mad and drowned them all. And then it happened after that. And then, um, you know, Goliath. David faced Goliath. Because a believing man married an unbelieving woman and uh, created Goliath. And then God told Israel to go in there and kill everything that breathed. Yeah. That's the kind of nonsense they teach in churches. You see, they hide their identity of these devils. Not all the Canaanites were giants. Not all of them. Some of the tribes were just look like us. God said, don't marry them. Don't marry them. Well, guess what? I'll guarantee you that almost every country in this world is being, is one of them. Jesus said, by their fruits, ye shall know them. You know, it kills me. Everybody thinks... They believe everything a politician says. Even when it's shown to be liars and deceivers, they still believe them. It's a false hope, I guess. So, what can I tell you? He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Of. Do you know what that word of means? It doesn't mean they're like. It doesn't mean they follow. Ladies, help me here. What When you bake a cake, what is the cake made of? Is the cake like flour and vanilla and butter and flavors? No, it's made of flour and butter and flavorings and sugar. You know, cakes are not like, cakes don't follow flour. Cakes are not like flour. They don't take the characteristics similar to flour. No, cakes are made of flour. It says, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Huh. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Wow. Wow. Is this talking about Cain? Hmm. 
The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Wow. You know, I mean, it, when you got uh, spiritual eyes to see, Bible makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense and you know what you don't know who Canaan and Ham got married to Bible doesn't tell you usually the word begat as in um, Adam begat Seth who begat you know on and on and on and on and on and you know David begat Solomon and uh, you got, it's, I can't even tell you how many times that word begat is in the Bible. A bunch of times. You can trace Christ back all the way to Adam. I think it's in the book of Luke. You know, he begat, who begat, and who begat, who begat, who begat. They, the reason those begats are in there is to let you know there's good seed and then there's bad seed. Let's take a look real quick at Ezra 9. Boy, this is a chapter you will never hear preached in a church. I mean, well, maybe, maybe one church out of a thousand. Now, the thing is, Israel had gone into Babylon for 70 years. Persia destroyed Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem to rebuild it and rebuild the temple. Uh, when you read about uh, Darius and Cyrus, uh, that's who, you know, they were the Persians. You know who the modern day Persians are? Iran, and yet our country, the U.S., and that little, it's really hell, state in the uh, Middle East, they want to destroy Iran. Sad, but uh, it'll probably happen. I thought it was going to happen years ago, but uh, I was wrong. So here it is. Judah had spent 70 years in captivity. They returned to Jerusalem and they're doing the rebuilding process. So Ezra records this. Uh, let's see. Ezra. I think Ezra was the priest and then Nehemiah was the king. If memory serves me correctly. But one of either Ezra or Nehemiah was the priest, and then the other one was the king. And I think Ezra was the priest. Um, verse 1. Ezra 9, verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Listen to this. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, 
so that the holy seed, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. You know what it means to be trespassing? It means you're in a place where you shouldn't be. That's trespassing. What did Jesus say about the good seed? Remember the sower that sowed the good seed? Verse 2, For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, H-O-L-Y, why in the world would the Lord say, you know, Ezra talk about a holy seed? You know, if there's a holy seed, there has to be an unholy seed. The tares, the weeds, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, the Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. So that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment. He ripped his garments and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. He pulled his hair out of his head. Have you ever heard somebody say the expression, I wanted to pull my hair out of my head. Well, he did. This was so vile to him. And if you keep reading this, you know what the solution was? They said, divorce your heathen sons and daughters and your wives. Divorce them. Send them away. Cast them out. But Chaplain Bob, God hates divorce. Yeah, he does hate divorce. But I'll tell you what. He hates mingling with this bad seed even worse. Now all these castaways, all these people that were cast out of the Canaanites and what have you, what do you think they're going to call themselves? Canaanites? No. I'm of the tribe of Judah, right? After all, they have Judah for, you know, if they go back far enough, they'll, they got Judah blood in them, right? But they also have the blood of the devil in them. Or devils. You know, these people didn't go away. They're still around. You ever wonder why some people can't hear the gospel? This is it, people. They're not of the Lord's sheep. They're not of his sheep. You know, when you get to the New Testament in John chapter 10, verses 23 through 29, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. You know, don't be doing these parable things, dude. Well, that's the Bob translation. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Remember, goats are born goats. And sheep are born sheep. Wheat sprouts wheat, and weeds put out weeds. You know, it's just the way it is. And a sheep might hang around with the goats, it might act like a goat, but it's still a sheep.
But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Praise Jesus for that. Oh, yeah. Now, were they not of his sheep because they didn't believe? Or did they not believe because they were not of his sheep? Ah, uh, you figure that one out. I don't think... I don't think they were sheep. I think they were goats. Well, maybe, you know, obviously not all of them. Eventually, uh, some came to believe in Christ. Some of the Pharisees became Christians. I mean, look at Paul, you know. But in Jerusalem, you had Judah. You had portion of Benjamin. And you had a portion of Levi. But the ten northern tribes, um, they had been taken into captivity, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred years earlier uh, by the Assyrians, who were eventually taken, um, conquered by Babylon. Babylon had conquered basically the entire known world at that time. I mean, they were in charge of everything. And Egypt was, uh, everybody wanted to conquer Egypt because Egypt was, uh, because of the Nile River, uh, it would flood the fields with water. And, you know, if you got water, you can, you got, um, you got crops. You don't have water. Well, you got a desert. You ain't going to grow much in the desert. That's for sure. But the, um, the Delta River Basin of the uh, Nile River, you had that was some re really fertile land. I mean, to this day, Egyptian cotton is really incredible. Uh, they found some Egyptian wheat inside of a pyramid, and they figured that wheat was well, you know, probably a couple thousand years old, and they. Um, examined it genetically if you can believe anything you know that they tell you and it was identical to some of the modern strains of wheat that we have today but they planted some of it and it grew can you imagine that wheat a couple thousand years old and it sprouted they found some grains of wheat in the um one of the pyramids you know, because the Egyptians had a little thing where uh, they would put things that the uh, the dead pharaohs or whoever was buried in the pyramids, some things that they said, well, you know, they're going to need this in the afterlife. Well, no, they're not really going to need it in the afterlife. You're either in the kingdom or you're in the other place. I should have packed some um, asbestos, fa asbestos underwear. That might have come in handy. I don't know. All right. Well, this is, um, I guess uh, this, we're going to cut this off for now. But uh, there's a reason why the Lord spoke in parables to people. There were people he didn't want to be saved. I mean, let's face it, King Herod, Pilate sent Jesus to King Herod. And you know what Jesus said to him? Nothing. You want proof of that? Let's go to Luke 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. Now, this is the, uh, they're getting ready to crucify Christ. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation 
and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Uh, which is a stinking lie, because they asked uh, Jesus if... Well, let's read that real quick. Well, that's in uh, Matthew 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Yeah, they want to twist, uh, convict Jesus with his words. You know, that's why a lot of lawyers tell people, don't talk to the police. Tell the police that you're invoking your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent and you wish to speak to an attorney before you answer any questions. Because anything you say can and will be used against you, but nothing you say can be used to help you. And that's what they're trying to do here. They're getting trying to get Jesus entangled with his talk. And they went out unto him with their disciples with the Herodians. Herodians are Herod's people. Saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? So, are we, so should we pay taxes, or should we be IRS uh, rejectors? That would be the modern translation, I guess. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and says, Why tempt ye me, you ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? In other words, whose picture is on this and whose writing is on this? You ever notice there's writing on a coin? Yeah, that's what superscription is. You ever heard a script? It has reference to writing. So, whose picture and writing is on this, this money? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he, Jesus, unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Yeah, you didn't want to try to trick Jesus with trick questions. It never works good. So let's go back to Luke 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Well, when they get thrown into the lake of fire, uh, they're going to have more than their, just their pants on fire. Uh, trust me. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. If you say so. I guess that's the modern translation. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, if you say so. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee unto this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. Oh yeah, Herod wants to see a magic show. For he was desirous to see him for a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Hey Jesus, put on a magic show for us. I hear you've put on a lot of magic shows for people. You know? Goats are goats, and sheep are sheep. 
Then he, Herod, questioned him, Jesus, in many words. Then he questioned him with him in many words. But he, Jesus, answered him nothing. Jesus said nothing to Herod. Did Jesus say, Repent and believe on me, Herod, and thou shalt be saved? No, he didn't. Herod, according to history, according to the Josephus, a Jewish historian, Herod was of Esau, Edom. Esau married into the Hittites of the Canaanites. Why didn't Jesus say, Herod, repent and believe on me, and I'll be your Savior because I love you? Uh, because he said nothing. Goats are goats, and sheep are sheep. Then he questioned him with, in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And uh, I think you know the rest of the story. Pilate tried to release him. You know? Listen to this. Romans chapter 9. You know, this is why they hate Paul, among other reasons. Romans 9. This, uh, boy, this is some powerful stuff. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. Verse 2. That I may have uh, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Uh, remember something. Paul's writing to the Romans here, but he's talking about Israelites. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh? Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now remember, Abraham had two sons. Hagar, the Egyptian bondwoman, had Ishmael, the firstborn. And then Sarah had Isaac. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Oh, but Chaplain Bob, God loves everybody and he wants everybody to be saved. Oh, really? Huh. Well, maybe we should keep reading here. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. 
but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. You see, Rebecca had twins, Esau and Jacob, who became Israel. And of course, the black Hebrews will say, Yo, you whitey, you be, you be Esau. Well, they say, yeah, Esau was white. Well, yeah, he was. But guess what? If they were twins, uh, they want you to believe that one baby was white and the other one was black. What? Boy, I tell you, it's, where's that in the Bible? I can't find it. They were twins. Yeah. They want us, uh, they want the Christians to be Esau. That is, uh, yeah. Listen to this carefully. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Read Malachi 1. This is quoting Malachi 1. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And they'll say, well, you know, Chaplain Bob, that, that word hated, no, that doesn't mean hated. No, no, no. That just means God loved Esau a little teeny tiny little bit less than Jacob. Uh, I'll tell you what, I took English in college for two years, and I know what the word hated means, okay? And the King James translators knew what the word hated means too. You know, read Malachi 1 and tell me when God says he's going to lay Esau's heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Yeah, that sounds like God loves Esau just a little teeny tiny bit less. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy all these people say well you know we it's it's up to you whether you accept jesus in your heart or not you got to run the race no it's god that shows the mercy if god knocks on your door you have the you have the ability to answer that door but if God doesn't answer the door, I mean, if God doesn't knock on the door, I don't know how you're going to open it. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. God raised up Pharaoh to show his power, people. Remember, God destroyed Egypt, almost virtually destroyed it. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, 
that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Remember, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor, and unto un another, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for uh, fitted to destruction? Vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Weeds, people, weeds, tares, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Verse 25. As he saith also in Osi, and this is Hosea, people, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. Uh, look up Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Look up Jeremiah 31, 31. Who do you think God's talking about here? And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. There shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Oh yeah, the Trump, uh, that space force, uh, short work. It ain't going to last very long. And as Isaiah saith before, except the Lord of Sabaoth hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma, Sodoma, and been like, and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have obtained a righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? Remember, James chapter 2, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have obtained a righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followeth followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What's this rock of offense, the stumbling stone? Let's take a look. Real quick, and then we're going to close this out. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to find out who this rock of offense, the stumbling stone. Now remember something. Corinth was a city in Greece. And the Corinthians were the residents of that city. You're talking about Greeks here. Another reason why they hate Paul. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Uh, the Red Sea. The, <laughs> and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
Paul's telling the Corinthians here that they were with Moses. Do you get it? They were with Moses when they came out of Egypt and they crossed through the Red Sea. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. The manna, right? And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And that rock was Christ. That's the stumbling stone. That's the rock of offense. People didn't, you know, they, the, the Pharisees wanted to keep the law. And you know what? The Noahide laws, to this day, they think their salvation is by Moses and the law. Totally reject Christ. Totally. They even admit in their own writings that Christ did all kinds of miracles. Of course, they say he did it by the power of the devil. But they admit he did miracles. You know, it's when your enemies admit that you are uh, have done things, you can believe it. You know, it's one thing. I know I've said it before, but, you know, like if you were a, a really good swimmer and your mother's bragging to everybody, oh, my son, he's a great swimmer. He's a great swimmer. You know, yeah, take it with a grain of salt, right? But when your people you're competing against say, boy, that guy, he is a good swimmer. He's a tough, he's tough to, he's a tough competitor to beat. Then, you know, then you're, uh, then you can believe it. Yeah. You know, when the people that don't like you admit that you did things like miracles, believe it, people. And they got a big thing nowadays. They, you know, they're the big thing now is like, oh, well, Rome invented Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church invented Jesus. Jesus never even existed. Really? The rabbis know he existed. The rabbis are proud that uh, their ancestors had him put to death. You're going to tell me he never existed? Really? I mean, this is the kind of stupidity that uh, I've encountered. I don't know. I guess for the last... 20, well, about 20 years, the Lord's been preparing me for uh, all this stuff. Maybe a little longer, but uh, yeah, I can't believe some of the heresies. Yeah, the, the, the Rome invented Jesus to control us. Right. I don't think so. So, all right, well. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.